Okay, let's start. So welcome everyone. Uh, now I'm going to show you new Cassandra 3 features. Uh, please raise your hand who is using or knowing Apache Cassandra here. Okay, some of you. Don't worry, I will not go too deep into detail if you are a beginner. Most of the talk will be demo. And of course, if you want more detail, you can ask me. I have extra content, so I have contents for everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Yui Hai Duan. I'm working as an Apache Cassandra evangelist. So my job consists of giving talks, conferences, and helping people to about Apache Cassandra, working also on open source projects around Apache Cassandra. So if you have any technical questions, you can drop me an email or ping me on Twitter. I am working for data stacks. So uh, the idea is Apache Cassandra belongs to the Apache Foundation. Okay. Data stacks, uh, we are the biggest contributor to this open source project. And we have offices in uh, Europe, in America. And the business model is very simple. You have the open source Apache Cassandra, and we provide the enterprise version with extra features. So for the agenda today, I'm going to show you materialized views, then some support for JSON to make your life easier new user-defined functions and aggregates for analytics. And the last one, which is very new and not released yet, it will be released in a few weeks, which is full text search uh, index. So let's start with materialized view. Why do we need those materialized views? In fact, most of people, when they start using Apache Cassandra, we used to tell them that they need to denormalize their data. For example, here I have a table, user table. So the way I define my table, I can search user by their ID, but that's all. So if I want to be able to search user by country, I need to create another table, user by country, and then I put the country column as a primary key. Because in Cassandra, you can only search data using the primary key, and that's all. Okay. So with, by denormalizing data, it means that you, as a developer, you need to take care of every time you write, you create a new user, you need to duplicate also the data in this table. It means also that you need to take care of update. So every time a new user updates his country, you need also to modify this table. So at it can become very complex if you have two or three denormalizations from a base table. So now the new materialized view feature will do it for you. It means that you now will declare a new materialized view, okay, user by country, as select. So you can select the columns you want to duplicate from the base table. So the base table here is user. You define a new primary key for searching. And then Apache Cassandra will create this table for you and will manage the life cycle of this table for you. So if you create a new user, Cassandra will insert a new row in this table. If you update a user country, Cassandra will update this table automatically for you. So some demo. So I have um, downloaded uh, a sample of um, some data, so music data from Spotify. So for example, I have a, I created an artist table, an album table. I loaded all the table from CSV file. So if we can, we want to see, uh, for example, I can show you some sample of the artist. Oh, sorry, the albums. Okay, you have the album title, the artist, the country, and some sample of the artist. 
So here you have the born date, the country of the artist, the gender, the name, musical style, type, and so on. Now, I want to create a materialized view on this artist table to be able to search the artist by country. Because with the original table, you can only search artist by ID, which is a random number, okay, which is not very convenient. So this is the syntax to create a materialized view. Artist by country, I select star from mu music artist. It means that I will duplicate all the columns from the base table. Country is not null. The where clause here is mandatory because you cannot have null value in a primary key. Okay, it doesn't make sense to have null value for primary key. So just create it. And now, once you create it, you can use this table. You can, you can use this view to query. So for example, I want to show all artists in Latvia. Okay. So this syntax, well, I am using Apache Zeppelin, which is um, a notebook, to be able to show you uh, the query on a web page. So it's nicer than using command line. So this syntax is to have a dynamic form. Okay. Now if I change it to, I don't know, uh, Russian Federation, show me all Russian artists. Okay. So you can see that with this view, I can filter all the artists by their country. Okay. So it is pretty simple. Now let's talk about performance because it is not free. When you are writing into a table which has many materialized view. It has some costs. It is slower because for each insert or update, Cassandra will do in the background for you. For example, if I want to update a country for one user, it means that Cassandra needs to delete the, the current value from the user by country and to insert a new value. Okay. So every time you do a mutation, the total number of mutation is the number of matrix view times two. It means that writing to a table which has view is slower because you have. Cassandra is doing a lot of write behind. But this comparison compared to a normal table is not fair because what we need to compare is we need to compare materialized view against the use case where you need to do denormalization by hand yourself, okay? In this case, materialized view is faster because it is managed by Cassandra, so you don't have the network traffic, you know, because uh, if you need to do it yourself, you need to read first what is the current value of the country, so you fetch data from Cassandra on the network back to the client, and then you do another update back to Cassandra. So with materialized view, we don't have this client server network traffic. And also it makes your life easier because you don't need to handle it anymore. What's about read performance? Because we were talking about write performance. We know that Cassandra is very fast for writing. Okay, what's about read performance? Sometimes we are creating the normalized table to be able to search, to search data from different points of uh, access, okay? Uh, so people can use also secondary index. There are some implementation of secondary index to be able to search data from a Cassandra table. Well, compared to a secondary index, materialized view is still much faster because with the normalization, when you are reading, you are reading from a single node because you are reading from a single partition. Whereas, if you are using secondary index, you may read 
you may hit many, many nodes, okay, on the cluster. Second thing is the read pass on disk. When you are using index, you have two reads. The first read is to fetch the index data, and the second read is to fetch the original data from Cassandra. With Materialize View, you have only one single read pass. The idea of Materialize View is I am ready to pay the cost at the right time so that when I'm reading, it is very, very fast. Another thing you need to be aware of is the consistency model. When you are writing to the base table with consistency level, well, it is hard not. But the consistency level and the consistency guarantee on materialized view is weaker because we don't have any distributed log. We don't want to log the whole database to synchronize the, the views with the base table. So the updates are eventually consistent. It means that it will be done sometime. Not immediate, you don't have immediate guarantee that the update to the view okay, will be done right now. Do you have any question so far? Yes. Um, the view are always refresh, but the refresh is done asynchronously. That's why we don't have strong warranty. Because when you are doing an asynchronous write, well, it may succeed or it may fail though, so it will be retried later by Cassandra, but you don't have any strong warranty. It completely asynchronous. No, you don't have strong this strong warranty. We we are aware of this. Uh, in fact, um, you have the same issue with uh, if you have to do it by uh, manually. Oh no, yes, because you are uh, you are when you are writing with consistency level, yes. But uh, we uh, if we want to provide stronger consistency, we need to lo to lock somehow, and we don't well not lock but performing synchronous write. And if you have like a five denormal, um, five materialized view on one table, you will wait a lot. So we don't want to, to, to slow down the, the write pass of the base table. And in fact, um, the, the, uh, the, the asynchronous write, they are, um, uh, we are using log batch. So it, even if it fails, it will be retried in the background by Cassandra for you. There was a question here. Well, where you are. Okay. So all the data is uh, duplicated, right? So the storage uh, space also grows. Exactly. Uh, exactly. As, uh, by the how many you want to select yes, the, exactly. the materialized view. If you have five materialized view, it, the, your data will be duplicated five times. There is no magic. We don't sell magic, we sell software. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you told that there's no writes are done asynchronously, but uh, like, how is some guarantee that after time, uh, all the changes I reflect to main table will be replicated into this materialized view. We are using batch log. So if the write fails, Cassandra will retry until it succeeds. That's how we guarantee that eventually it will be up to date. Okay, let's move to the next uh, thing. We can, we can go into details later uh, of materialized view if uh, we have some time because I don't want to spend too much time in the technical stuff because we have many things to cover. So JSON syntax. Why JSON? Well, JSON is a terrible schema. In fact, it's not a schema. There's no schema with JSON, right? Uh, just a, a syntax convention. But it is a very good exchange format. Because people are using JSON for REST API, and it is technology agnostic. It means that you can use JavaScript, Java, Scala, 
any language can handle JSON. So until now, this is a classical data stream we, we have seen many times in production. So you have a web front end or whatever, a service, which is calling a REST service using HTTP, of course. And then this will be handled by your application server. You transform this HTTP call into a select. Okay. I want to get user by ID. Then Cassandra will return your user as a tabular format okay, with rows and columns. And you need to transform this tabular format into a JSON manually. Well, it's not very difficult. There are so many frameworks out there to do it for you. But still, this step, you need to do it. Now with JSON support, the, the answer, instead of answering with a tabular format, Cassandra can answer directly, can format your data at the JSON directly. So you remove this transformation step. Okay. So let's have some demo. Pretty simple. So I, I am creating a table users, okay, with ID, name, age, country, hobbies, which is a collection, a list. Now I can insert into this table using a JSON syntax. For example, some external service provide me the payload as a JSON. So I don't need to transform it. I just push it directly to Cassandra, okay? So John Doe, Helen Chu. And then I can select also the data as a JSON string. So let's see. Okay, I insert using JSON and I select with JSON format. You can also use the JSON with update. We provide two extra functions. They are system function. So you can update a, col a column and you can call from JSON. It means that you, you paste in a string and the function from JSON will turn it into collection or the, the appropriate type for you. For example, here, I want to change um, Helen Sue hobby, so she were fun of cooking and politics. Now she finds that politics is too boring, so now cooking's and movie. Okay, so I do him, I'm doing an update with from JSON, and then I can select, and I can use the two JSON method, two JSON function, sorry. So pretty simple. And of course, you can also um, mix it with regular syntax. For example, age, name. You see? So it is very straightforward. So all this is for convenience for developers. Any question for JSON syntax? Yes. So the support of JSON uh, is still single level deep, right? It's not no, nested. No, you can have many nested. You have if you create a type, a custom type, uh -huh. it will also um, deserialize for you. Oh, OK. And uh, on the validation, so can you like mix schemas and stuff like that? It's like uh, you define that uh, you will have an object which contains text. Can you push in? Uh, integers JSON style, or is gonna like reject it, right? Well, the validation is uh, using your um, your schema. So, uh -huh. so, ah, it, okay. so you have a schema here. So if you try to push, for example, if I try to push a column which is not ex does not exist, for example, let's see in live. Okay, this column doesn't exist, right? Just click. Yeah. Okay, so that's the column type, and and the type types are also the same type. Yeah, we yeah. well the the problem with JSON is everything is a string or boolean on in a number. So we try to guess it. Well, we we try to we try the um, 
we try to, to, to match the type as uh, precise as possible. If you want to, um, there is some blog posts um, which uh, on um, Datastack's uh, dev blog, which explain you how we try to, to match different types to string. For example, uh, if you have a date, we have some default formatting for date. So uh, we, we will pass the, the string as a date using this default format. Okay, thank you. No other question? User defined function. New feature. The idea is I want to be able for simple transformation to push the computation to the server. Because, for example, if I want to do some formatting, lowercase, uppercase, for example, to a string, well, you, you can fetch data. Or you, if you want to do a sum, for example, you can fetch data, all the data to the client side and then do a sum yourself. Very easy. Problem is, if you have a, cl a cluster of 1,000 nodes, it costs you a lot of network traffic. So it's better to push the computation to the cluster. And we can use those functions also to, uh, with uh, the Spark Cassandra connector to pre-aggregate. So it is not possible right now that I'm working on this to be able to push down when you are doing a Spark SQL query and you are using a Cassandra function, it will be pushed down directly into Cassandra. So how to create? A user-defined function. Well, the syntax is quite simple. Create or replace function if not exist. Key space, function name. Here you have parameter name, the type, a list of parameters and their type. The type is a Cassandra type, okay? Not Java type. Then you have this clause, call on null input. It means that your function will always be trigger. We don't care about null values for your parameters. It means that in your source code, you need to perform null check. Otherwise, null point or exception. Okay. Or you can take return nulls or null input. It means that if only one of the parameter is null, Cassandra will not execute the function and return null directly. So in this case, you are sure that you will ne never have null parameter exception because we skip the execution of the function if there is any null parameter. Return type, well, again, it is a Cassandra type. So you can use primitive types, collections, tuple types, user-defined types. We support many languages, so by default, Java. Um, also. JavaScript. With uh, Java 8, we have the Nash Horn engine to execute JavaScript inside JVM. Um, if you want to use Scala or Groovy, you need to add extra jar in the class pass on the server, of course. And then you have a block of source code. So let's see uh, some example. I have a complex example. So I have some artists. Each artist has a born date and a die date, or the die date is null because they are still alive. The problem is um, now I want to be able to compute the age of each artist based on the born date and the die date, if it exists, of course. So the problem with my data is, um, in my data set, I have the date is not uh, correctly formatted. So sometimes you have year, month, day. Sometimes you have only the months. And sometimes you have only the year. So there is a mix of uh, different formats. So I'm, I'm using um, regular expression. So if the born date is null, well, if the born date is not provided, I can not do anything. So I just return null. I cannot compute the age. If I have the born date, but the die date is null or empty, it means that the, the artist is still alive. So we can compute his age by just taking the current, the, cur the, the, the current year 
and make the difference, okay? And when we have both bound date and die date, well, just simple, we parse, we extract the year, and then we compute the difference. And of course, I encapsulate all this processing into a try catch number format exception. Okay, so it, this source code has been sent to the Cassandra server, compiled on the server, and now available for use. So now, let's see, I have extracted some ID for some artists, Maria Carey, John Lennon, Tokyo, Electron, not very well known. So select the name of the artist, compute age, born, die, and I also display the original born and died date, so we can see the result. Okay, here for Tokyo Electron, since we don't have any date, well, we cannot compute the age, so we don't know. Maria Carey is still alive, so we know that she is 46. John Lennon, well, he died in the past. We have all the dates, so we, we are able to compu compute also the age. Pretty simple. So this is for user-defined function. But the idea of user-defined function is to provide you a way to aggregate data. Because by itself, doing transformation on raw data is not that interesting. What is much more interesting is being able to aggregate. So by default, Cassandra 3.0 is shipped with some average aggregate function. So it already exists out of the box. You can use it. Okay. Now I will show you how to create an aggregate. So the syntax is very different. Create or replace aggregate, if not exist. The name of the aggregate. And now this time, you don't have the parameter. You have only the types. You need to provide as func an accumulator function. So think about, and you need to provide also a state to accumulate the data. Think about for the left operation on um, a stream of data. If you are familiar with Java 8 stream, you have the for left operation. So this is exactly like this. You have a function to accumulate, you have the state to store the data. Optionally, you can provide a finite function to perform a finite processing before returning the result. And you can provide also an initial condition for the full left operation. And you have some constraint here, implicit constraint. It means that your accumulator function need to have this signature. So the first parameter, the first type, should be the state type of your aggregate. And then the following type should be the same as the type def defined on your aggregate. And it should return the state type. Okay. Finance function, optional. So some demo, you will s it will be clearer when I show you the demo. OK. First, before defining an aggregate, I need to define the accumulator function first. So here is my accumulator function, style count. This is my, st my state. So I have a map of text and begin. What is this? And I have a list of musical style. Okay, let me show you back. The artists, um, they have some musical style, okay? This is the list of musical style. Rock, soul, unknown, unknown. For example, 100. We have some more data. Okay, exponent and rock, chamber, alternative, and so on. So my accumulator function here, for each, Musical style I found in a list. 
I increment the counter. The counter e here is the big int. Okay. So for each object in the, in the style, if this style already exists in my map, in my state, I just increment by one. Otherwise, I initiate it with one. And then I can reuse this accumulator function to define my aggregate style distribution. Okay, yeah. This syntax, this um, bracket here, it means this is an empty map using Cassandra literal. Okay. So let's create it. Oh, error. Ah. Function style count, yeah. still referenced by style distribution. Okay. So if you need, when you need, when you drop your aggregate, you need to drop first the aggregate and then the function. So aggregate is style distribution. Okay. Okay, done. Now let's use it with our materialized view. Remember, artist by country, the view. I want to have the style distribution for our own artists in United Kingdom, in UK. So here you are. This is the, the map, the okay. unknown. So lots of artists with unknown style, rock, indie, blah, 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 blah. blah. Careful, there are some traps. Aggregates in Cassandra, those functions, they are not distributed. The, the aggregate function is executed on the coordinator. Why? What is the reason? Because of um, the consistency model. Because we, you need to fetch data first from different replica, apply the last bright win rule, and then apply the function. If you push the computation on each replica, and if they are not synchronized, you will run into trouble. Okay. Be careful also to use them on large number of rows. For example, you have a single partition with billions, billions of data. Well, it will take time. It is not recommended to, to use aggregate for full table scan. In fact, you will do a full cluster scan. Okay. And when you are using user-defined aggregate, you need to increase the client-side timeout. Because the default timeout value for the Java driver is 12 seconds. So 12 seconds is, is largely enough for simple operation, insert, select. But when you are aggregating a lot of data, well, it may take time. Nobody is complaining that spark is taking one minute. Okay, nobody's complaining because you are processing a lot of data. So in this case, if you want to use Cassandra user-defined aggregate, don't forget to increase this timeout. Still, there are some recommendations. Okay. The best use case for user-defined aggregates is when you are applying it on a single partition. If you need to do aggregation on multiple partition or on a whole table, Apache Spark is a better choice because the job is distributed. Okay. So there is no magic. The best use case is single partition. Question? Yes. Hello. Uh, so, what is um, uh, is uh, import supported by uh, user-defined functions? What I, is I mean, imports in Java, are they supported? If I don't want to put uh, ah, no. no, there is no import. 
In fact, uh, what I didn't say, because I don't want to go too, too deep into the detailed technical implementation, is your source code, the source code you are pushing to Cassandra, this source code, this block of code, we have a lot of checks. Like we are doing by code verifier, it is forbidden to create a new, for example, new thread. Forbidden, right? Of course, what are you doing? What are you creating a new thread on a server, right? Uh, opening a new socket on a network, it is forbidden. So we have a, a blacklist of all forbidden classes. You cannot instantiate a new, uh, I don't know, network instance, okay? Uh, and a white list of what you can use. So it is pretty limited and for good reason because if we allow people to do anything well, you are sure that they will break your cluster, right? And there is another reason is if you need to import a lot of library to create your function, to implement your function, it means that your function is too complex to be run on a server. Those, those functions are reserved for very simple transformation. If you look at my example here. Finally, this is quite simple, okay? If you need to, to, I don't know, to import Guava, to import Spring, blah, to run on server, it means that, yeah, don't do that. Just fetch the data, filter them, and I perform your complex processing on the client side. And we also run all those user-defined functions in a different thread pool so that it doesn't break, it doesn't have any impact on the existing thread pool of Cassandra itself. So we, we try to isolate the execution. Yes. Uh they are also killed after time limit when the same time limit as the connection or are they uh, left running for a bit while and there's another? No, we have um, a new properties um, in Cassandra.yaml5. You can define a warning timeout and um, error timeout. So every time we, we execute a function, we did it in a um, different class loader, a different thread pool, and we monitor the, um, the duration. So if it exceeds a warning threshold, we reschedule the execution. And after it reaches the, the error, we just kill it. And it's, oh, sorry, I cannot. Uh, same goes for not for just time limit, but for also for memory limit, I assume, right? There is Right now, there is no memory limit. It means that if you are crazy enough and you are creating a map of a bunch of objects, well, you will just destroy the, the JVM. There is, right now, there is no limitation on the, the memory. We only limit on the, on the time you can take to execute a function. Yes, question. What? On the coordinator. No. The coordinator will distribute the source code also and it will be recompiled. But in fact, if it fails, the compilation fails for some reason on the coordinator, well, it will stop there. If it succeeds, you know that it will succeed also on the replicas, on all, all the nodes. So. Oh yeah, I know. Um, they, we have, um, we use the, um, the schema, uh, schema, you know, the gossip, the gossip protocol can detect that there are uh, mismatch, because in fact a function is a is considered by Cassandra as a schema object, and uh, so the gossip is okay. There is a mismatch on a schema object with a function uh, aggregate, so it will warn you. The, the, it will push to all nodes. Yes, exactly. Other question? Yes, here. Uh, 
one more question. Uh, if uh, an unhandled exception will be thrown from the function, what will be returned to the client? For example, null pointer exception. Well, we will return the exception at it. I think we can try. <laughs> well, if I uh, if I need to try some, um, we can try. Yes, we can remove this, but you know, I also need to try some. Um, Oh yeah, you are crazy. Okay, let's uh, let's be crazy. Let's be crazy. He is right. Let's write how new. No, you can just do this. Error. Okay, you are right. What is this? Ah, yeah. Okay, let's just delete everything. Copy paste. Okay. <gasps> okay. You have here Java long time. And finally, the SAS index. This one is really big. SAS means uh, SS table attached secondary index. So why SAS? Searching and full text search was always, always a big issue, big pain, pain point with Cassandra. You have limited search predicates. For example, you are limited to e equality and inequalities only. Limited scope for your search, you can only search on primary key columns. And of course, we have a secondary index, but its performance is very poor because basically it is very simple index. It is a reverse index, okay? So for example, if you create a secondary index on country, the primary key of this uh, table will be the country and uh, the value is the ID of the, the user. So it's really, really stupid. And it uses Cassandra itself as an index storage, which may not be the best option. Also, the current secondary index has very limited predicates. So you, are, you can use only equality. If you choose to use an inequality, well, you will do a full cluster scan somehow. There's no magic. So now, this new index we will propose a new index data structure, which is suffix trees, for those who know, okay, to be able to search uh, text values. They also uh, extend the predicate. Now we support equality, inequalities, and like percentage, like in SQL, okay, for full text search. And for full text search, you can also define tokenizer stop world stemming, like what Apache Lucene do. Sassy has also a query planner to optimize the predicates. For example, here you have many predicates, blah, blah, and age less than 100, and first name start with P, and first name this doesn't start with PA, and age greater than 21. So the query planner will try to reorder all those clothes to optimize the query. And we don't use Apache Lucene. Uh, there are some implementation of secondary index out there on the open source uh, community that is using Apache Lucene. But the, f the, f the fact is that Apache Lucene is a very, very powerful text search engine. But it is too powerful. It means that there are so many features that we don't need. And what we need is a, a, a small subset of Lucene. For example, Lucene can do scoring. Do you need scoring for 80% of the use cases? So uh, the implementers of SASE, they decided to, to create their own data structure index. And they don't use Apache Lucene. Who? Well, we need to thank them. 
it is a team working at Apple. So those five people, they develop it, they use it at Apple, and then they contribute back to the open source. It means that it has it is working on production right now. Some demo. Okay. So I have my album table. I want to be able to search on the title with full text search. So I use the custom SASE index. So I give this the full class name here. You have some options. So the mod is contained. It means that you can use the like percentage predicate to search data. I'm using the standard analyzer with stemming enable and normalize to lowercase. I want to be able to search on the artist name also, but this time I don't want tokenizer. Tokenize, what is tokenizing? Tokenizing is it will split the, your text into many, many tokens. And for artist name, I, want, I don't care about tokens, so I want to be able to search by arti artist name. Mod contains also. So the analyzer is non-tokenizing and I deactivate case sensitivity. For country, for the, um, for the country, I want to be able to search with exact value. I don't care about like percentage, so I give the exact name of the country. So the mod is prefix. And for numeric values, you should use the mod sparse. Okay. So now let's use SASE. Give me all the albums where the artist's name is like Jackson, and the title contains the love. Country is USA, exactly. And the release date of this album is between 1980 and 2010. So I have already the answer here. I can change. Uh, give me some example of name. Lower K Jackson. It should work the same because I decided to normalize lower case. So it's case insensitive. Yeah, Jack. Tell me, Jack. Oh, because my predicate is so, so, there are so many predicates that, uh, yeah, if. Yeah, something like this. Uh, Allow filtering, well, is uh, because with the secondary, normal secondary index, if you have many close many um, index together, you need to put a lot of entering. It means that warning, you are going to scan the whole cluster. But with SASE, since we have the query planner, it will be optimized. But right now, the first implementation, we don't want to break backward compatibility with uh, you know, the normal secondary index. So we need to, to give a lot of entering. But it's still fine. So Jack, OK, so Jack of Jack, Jack Hill. USA, okay. Yes? Oh, you can define also the language. Um, you can, uh, I didn't put it here, but the local, uh, you can choose, there is another parameter to choose the local. It, it can be English, it can be French, it can be Chinese. Yeah, of course. I I don't list all of them, of course. And you can also implement your own analyzer, if you wish. But you you need to put it uh, on the server, uh, on in the class pass. 
So I think it's uh, time is running out. So I will finish with when next release scheduled for March. So in a few weeks. And later, because this is the f only the first step, later we will support all close also. So you can write something like A, where A or B and C or D, and you can compose all this. And those will be optimized with the query planner. And we want to be able to also to index on collection, set list map, and static columns, and whatever. Thank you.